Hello and welcome to the second part of my talk about the event-driven RTOS kernel called Super Simple Tasker SST. In this part you will see how SST works internally and specifically how it maps to the hardware of ARM Cortex-M. Earlier in the introduction to event-driven real-time kernels you saw that they break up with the traditional endless loop structure. Instead, tasks in event-driven kernels are one-shot, run-to-completion activations without internal blocking. This should remind you of something you know very well. Yes, this is precisely how interrupt service routines, ISRs, work. In any CPU design, ISRs are one-shot, run-to-completion activations that are not allowed to block. This is also no wonder, because ISRs are handlers for hardware events and, like all event handlers, they must be non-blocking. However, in ARM Cortex-M processors, ISRs have three additional, rather unique properties. The Cortex-M CPU has been specifically designed to allow programming ISRs as regular C functions. This is unusual among embedded CPUs, and to understand the exact hardware mechanism to support this, I recommend my video lesson 18, How Interrupts Work in ARM Cortex-M. Second, interrupts in Cortex-M can preempt each other based on the configurable priorities. This interrupt nesting and prioritization is managed entirely in hardware by the standard component of all Cortex-M CPUs called the Nested Vectored Interrupt Controller, ENVIC. And third, all interrupts in Cortex-M can be individually pended, meaning triggered in software. I hope you can see that all this looks quite close to how SST manages tasks, but of course there are several points to work out to quote hijack Cortex-M interrupts for SST tasks. But before going into these details, let me quickly review how the ENVIC manages interrupts and specifically how it handles the stack. Consider the following scenario shown on the left. The Cortex-M CPU is running in privileged thread mode which is the mode it starts executing the main function out of reset. The main stack is used a little. At some point, interrupt number 1 is triggered. Assuming the interrupts are not disabled, the CPU immediately switches to the handler mode and pushes the interrupt stack frame on the main stack. Here it is shown as the stack point dropping in value because the Cortex-M stack grows down. The low priority interrupts 1 becomes active. At some later point, a higher priority interrupt 2 is triggered. The ENVIC determines that interrupt preemption is needed and the CPU pushes another interrupt stack frame to the main stack. The high priority interrupt 2 becomes active while the low priority interrupt 1 is preempted during its execution. Please note that there is no need for a different stack here because this is an asynchronous preemption of interrupt 1 by interrupt 2 not a voluntary blocking of interrupt 1, which interrupts cannot do anyway. At some later point, interrupt 2 finishes its run to completion RTC step and returns, removing itself from the main stack. The ENVIC detects that another interrupt 1 is still active, so its execution is resumed. At some later point, interrupt 1 also completes its RTC step removes itself from the main stack and the CPU goes back to running the original main loop in the privileged thread mode. This simple scenario dispels a misconception I often encounter that run to completion RTC means monopolizing the CPU for the whole duration of the RTC step. As you can see here, this is not the case. Preemption and RTC can happily coexist. Specifically, the RTC semantics of interrupt 1 is not violated. The RTC step is only interrupted, but then resumes and eventually completes. Regarding the scenario on the right, the order of triggering the interrupts is reversed. The high priority interrupt 2 triggers first, and the low priority interrupt 1 triggers later. This time around, the ENVIC does not initiate preemption, and interrupt 2 keeps running undisturbed. The important point here is that interrupt 1 is not lost and remains pended until interrupt 2 runs to completion. Only then interrupt 1 is activated. 
Interestingly, in this case, the NVIC optimizes away the usual unstacking registers by the return from interrupt 2 and stacking the registers by entry to interrupt 1. This hardware optimization is called tail chaining. In summary, the NVIC implements in hardware an optimized preemptive priority based scheduler which works exactly according to the requirements of rate monotonic scheduling RMS method. This non-blocking scheduler uses the single stack, the main stack of the ARM Cortex-M CPU, to hold the context of all nested interrupts. Now, because all the scheduling and management of interrupt nesting is implemented in the NVIC hardware, the complexity of it snowballs with the number of supported interrupt priorities. Therefore, various silicon vendors who license ARM cores can implement fewer interrupt priority bits within limits specific to a given ARM architecture. For example, ARM V6M architecture of Cortex-M0, M0+, Plus implements only the two most significant priority bits, which results in four interrupt priorities. The diagram also shows the peculiar NVIC priority numbering scheme, where lower numerical values correspond to a higher urgency of an interrupt. ARM V7M of Cortex-M3, M4 implements a minimum of three most significant priority bits, but some silicon, like STM32, implements four bits. This results in either 8 or 16 interrupt priorities. The ARM V7M architecture additionally supports priority grouping, but I will assume that this is not used and that all implemented priority bits are available. Now, finally getting to the SST kernel, here is how the highest NVIC priorities are allocated to interrupts, also called IRQs, and lower priorities to SST tasks. You can also see the SST priority numbering scheme, which is direct and not inverted like the NVIC. In SST, the absolute lowest priority 0 is assigned to the idle task, and higher numbers correspond to SST tasks of higher priority. So now let me show you how this repurposing of NVIC IRQs for SST tasks looks in the code of the blinky button example I discussed previously. On the left you can see the startup code for the STM32L053 MCU and specifically the vector table for that MCU. The blinky button example needs four SST tasks, so I chose four IRQ handlers not used in that particular application. On the right is the board support package, BSP, for the L053 MCU, where you can see the implementations of the selected IRQ handlers. As mentioned, all of them are regular C functions consisting of activations of the specific SST tasks. For example, the I2C2 IRQ handler activates the Blinky1 SST task. Every SST task must also know the associated IRQ number to pen the right IRQ in software. This IRQ number is provided to the task via the call SST task set IRQ. Before finishing with the vector table, let me mention an alternative if you run out of unused IRQs, which would be somewhat unusual. In that case, you can often repurpose some of the reserved IRQ entries in the vector table. This other alternative can be activated in the code by commenting out the macro regular IRQs. Now the SST task activation, which is all the IRQ handler does, is implemented in the SST port to ARM Cortex-M. This function consists of two main steps. The first step is to get the event out of the event queue owned by this task. The second step is to call the task's dispatch function to process this event to completion. In the earlier demonstration you saw examples of the dispatch functions for the various blinky button tasks. Regarding the first step of getting the event out of the queue, I'd like to point out three important elements. First, the queue must have some events, which is asserted in the precondition to the activate function. Second, the event is dequeued from the tail index of the queue, but this tail index is accessed only from the owner task. Therefore, there is no need for a critical section. On the other hand, a critical section is needed to decrement the used counter of the queue because this one is accessed in the generally accessible post operation. And third, 
If there are still some used entries in the queue, meaning it still has some events, the IR queue associated with the task is pended. This is necessary because the pend bit is cleared automatically in hardware when the IR queue handler is activated. By the way, you can see here how to pend an IR queue from the software. This specific way is designed to generate good machine code consisting of just three instructions. Now regarding posting events to SSD tasks, which is the main way of communication and synchronization in this event-driven kernel, it is implemented in the SSD task post function in the platform independent SSD code SSD.C. This is a standard algorithm to insert an entry into a ring buffer at the head index. But this time the whole algorithm executes in the critical section because event posting can happen concurrently both from tasks and interrupts. Again, let me point out a few important elements. First, the queue must have room for the event, which is asserted in the precondition. At first you might object that overflowing an event queue should not be treated as an error. But the failure to post an event in an event-driven system is equivalent to a failure to call a function in a sequential system. Let me explain. A sequential system, such as a traditional Arthos thread, might fail to call a function when it runs out of private stack space. In that case, everybody understands that all the private stacks must be sized adequately so that they don't overflow. Event-driven tasks have no private stacks, but they have event queues instead. For the same reason, these event queues must be sized adequately so that they don't overflow. The second aspect of event posting I'd like to point out is the pending of the associated IR queue, which is the same you saw already in the task activate function. This code is specific to the ARM Cortex-M and therefore the platform independent code calls a macro from the port. In summary of this quick SSD kernel overview, I'd like to remind you again that all SSD source code and examples are available on GitHub. Besides the SSD in C you just saw, there is also SSD in C++. Furthermore, the SSD repository also contains the even simpler, non-preemptive implementation of the SSD API called SSD0, which is an interesting kernel as well. Now, in the last few minutes of this presentation, I'd like to show you how fast SST for Cortex-M really is. Of course, fast has no absolute meaning, only relative to something else that is generally known. Therefore, for such comparison, I chose the popular FreeRTOS traditional blocking kernel, to which I ported the blinky button example. That project is also available in the SST repository in the directory FreeRTOS comparison. Let me open the FreeRTOS Blinky Button example project in Microvision and explain it a bit because it illustrates how to do event-driven programming in a traditional kernel. This project is located in Super Simple Tasker, FreeRTOS Comparison, Examples, Blinky Button, ARM Clung. So here is, for instance, the Button 2A task implemented with FreeRTOS. It is structured as an event loop that blocks at the top on the free Arthos message queue associated with the task. The queue is set up to block indefinitely as long as there are no events. Once the queue unblocks and delivers an event, the button to a dispatch function processes the received event. This is the non-blocking run to completion step of the event loop. You should note here that event-driven non-blocking code is far more versatile than blocking code. You can use event-driven code everywhere, in a traditional Arthos, in an event-driven kernel, or even directly in a superloop. In contrast, code that makes any blocking calls is only usable with an Arthos that provides the specific blocking primitives, like a blocking time delay, a semaphore, or whatever other blocking mechanism is used. The button to a dispatch function is conceptually identical to the previous one from the SST kernel, which I show for comparison on the right. The only differences are that event posting to other tasks needs to be recoded using the free Arthos message queue API. The other significant differences are in how tasks are started, whereas in free Arthos you need to provide both a private stack and private queue for every task.
Again, the SSD code is shown on the right for comparison. Alright, so let me now build the FreeRTOS project and load it to the same STM32 Nucleo L053 board as used in the SSD demonstration. Again, this is a low-end Cortex-M0 Plus CPU running at measly 2 MHz. With the FreeRTOS Blinky Button version loaded to the board, I will trigger the same scenario as before with the SSD version. I'll trigger on the button line going low when the button is pressed. Ok, so we have a trace with three Arthos. For comparison, I place the analogous trace recorded for SSD. Well, the traces are apparently very different, the main discrepancy being the cystic rate. This is because the free Arthos cystic had to be reduced by an order of magnitude from 1000 ticks per second, as it was in SSD version, to only 100 ticks per second. Otherwise, due to much higher kernel overhead, the software would overwhelm the slow CPU, which scientifically is called an unschedulable set of tasks. Now let's look at the scenario that plays out at the second cystic after the button press, because it takes two ticks to debounce the button. So here is the zoomed in scenario, with the same time scales in both views. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to discuss all the differences in detail, but let me only point out a few interesting spots. First is the much longer task level response of the FreeRTOS kernel, which is the time from the end of the ISR to the beginning of the button to a task that was scheduled in that cystic. Second, the arbitration between equal priority tasks button to A and button to B plays out differently in FreeRTOS than SSD. The hardware scheduler built into the NVIC apparently schedules button to B ahead of button to A because button to B has a lower IRQ number. FreeRTOS keeps running button to A. This is not a critical issue because this is not a question of preemption, just arbitration of equal priority tasks. Now, regarding the preemption of medium priority button 2B by high priority Blinky 3, both kernels handle it the same way, except it takes almost five times longer in FreeRTOS than SST. The factors contributing to latency here are the more elaborate context switch in the traditional kernel, and also the performance differences in the event queue between the kernels. Finally, to show you that in fact the same compiler optimizations and timescales have been used in both views, I highlighted the pin toggling times in the button 2A task, which are identical because they don't depend on the kernel. In conclusion, Super Simple Tasker SST is an event driven, non blocking, preemptive kernel with properties that allow it to be implemented almost entirely in hardware of the popular ARM Cortex M CPUs. Interestingly, in case you didn't notice, this SST implementation was entirely in C and didn't require a single line in assembly. But this talk was also about the larger issues of programming paradigms, where I presented some evidence for the following claims. If you want your software to be more reliable, make it event-driven. If you want your software to be hard real-time, make it event-driven. If you want your software to be more flexible and extensible, make it event-driven. If you want your software to be modern and suitable for modeling and automatic code generation, make it event-driven. Finally, if you want your software to be truly efficient, make it event-driven, which also implies non-blocking. I'd like to close this presentation about the super simple tasker with a quote from Austin Freeman. Simplicity is the soul of efficiency. Thank you for watching.